we're here today for our, our sixth and final sermon in our series on running into God. And, you know, to be honest, I kind of feel like that teacher on the last day of class before, uh, before the big exam, so I want to do a little run through, but we scared them over at traditional worship. We told them there would be a test at the end, and they all got really scared, and especially when we told 11 o'clock that 8.45 service hadn't really passed. Um, we didn't tell them what would happen to them. We just told them they had it passed. But anyway, not going to be a test, but I do want to spend a few moments and go back over what we've been talking about, because the whole series has been about different ways that we run into God. And what it means for us when we do run into God. If you remember five weeks ago, we started with the big competition. We had, had God on this side, but all on that side. And, and God was able to send down fire from heaven. And when the people saw God in the fire from heaven, they came to faith. And it's a reminder that when we run into God, we come to faith. That's how we come to faith. It's through our experiences of God. Then the next week, we learned about the widow from Zarephath who was... She was down to her last handful of grain, the last little bit of oil in a jug. She was preparing herself and her son to eat that last meal and then die. But she ran into God, and God sustained her throughout the entirety of the drought. We were reminded that just like her, we still run into God at the bottom of the barrel. Then the next week, we we ran into Elijah. We met Elijah as he was running for his life, running away from Queen Jezebel. Do you all remember that? His little slight miscalculation where... uh, he forgot that if he killed all her prophets, she might be mad. And then she was, and she vowed to kill him. And so he took off running. He thought he was trying to run from God, but he learned that he couldn't outrun God. In fact, he actually ran into God. Ran into God in the still small house. It's that reminder that when we get overwhelmed, when we feel like it all depends upon us, we need to step back. We need to take some time to be quiet, to be still, to know that the Lord is God. And to know that God's still raising up people to walk alongside us. And then we followed Elijah, followed Elijah as he was strengthened by that encounter with God. And he went back to Israel. And God called him to stand up to King Ahab. If you remember King Ahab, he was the worst king ever. And the prophet was supposed to stand up to him for, because King Ahab had, had killed Naboth and stolen his vineyard. And it was a reminder that when we run into God, when we're strengthened by God, we're, we're called to go back about God's work. Because God's business is our business, and that's God's justice and God's righteousness, standing up for those things in the political arena, in the social arena, in the economic arena. And then last week we saw that transfer of power from Elijah to Elisha, a reminder. And remember, Bear got so tongue-tied, Elijah, Elisha, Elisha, Elijah. Unfortunately today I just have to deal with Elisha, but if I say Elijah, just know I'm in Elisha, because they trip us up. But we had that transfer of power from Elijah to Elisha. And in it, we were called to remember our mentors. Who are those people who taught us the faith? Or who are those people we are mentoring? Who are we teaching the faith? Because so often we run into God while being mentored or also while mentoring someone else. Those, those relationships of, of mentor and mentee are so special and they're so sacred because it's often how we run into God. So today we're here for our sixth and final chapter. But while we do, before we do that, let's pray together. Eternal God, Lord, you know, our whole prayer, this, this whole series hasn't been that we will just hear these stories about how people have run into you, but that in hearing them and in meditating on them, that, that we would run into you, that you would run into us, Lord. So Lord, now move in this place. But we know that you've already met so many of us in the singing here. Continue to meet us as we were here and re- reflect on your word. And then as we come to the table, Lord, meet us here today. Let us run into you. Amen. Our last story in this series comes from 2 Kings. It comes from the fifth chapter of 2 Kings, and it's about Naaman. Now, Naaman is the commander of the army of Aram. And one of the things we haven't really talked about, but is going on in the background of all the stories we've been reading, is that Israel, the nation of Israel, is in a series of wars with the nation of Aram. And at least recently, they haven't been doing all that well. It was actually in a battle with Aram that Ahab, the worst king ever who we've talked about before, was actually in a battle with Aram that he was killed. That happened shortly before, um, before our story today. And it's very likely that Naaman was the commander in the attack in which King Ahab was killed. He's kind of Israel's public enemy number one. He's probably the person that the little Israelite kids had nightmares about. 
You know, he's, he's just their chief enemy, their number one enemy, but the story is about him, this commander of the army of Aram. The Bible says he was a great man and in high favor with his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from leprosy. Now the Arameans, on one of their raids, had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her, mister, her mistress, If only my lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his lord just what the girl from the land of Israel had said. And the king of Aram said, Go then, and I will send along a letter to the king of Israel. He went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of garments. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you my servant Naaman, that you may cure him of his leprosy. But when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to give death or life? And that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Just look and see how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me. And what's going on here is the king of Israel, at this point is Jehoram, is one of Ahab's sons. He's not as bad as Ahab, because Ahab was the worst king ever. But he's not really good either. The Bible says that he still did evil in the sight of the Lord. And we'll get back to that in just a little bit. But the point is, he gets this letter from the king of Aram, and what he thinks is going on is that the king of Aram has sent Naaman to ask an impossible request, so that when he, as the king of Israel, can't grant the request, Aram can be insulted so that they then have reason to launch another attack. He just lost out of the battle. Now he thinks they're trying to pick another fight. And he tears his clothes, which is a biblical sign of mourning, of not knowing what to do. But then as God so often does in the series, God shows up. And he shows up in the prophet Elisha. The Bible continues, When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go, wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry and went away, saying, I thought that for me he would surely come out. Come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, and he would wave his hand over the spot and cure the leprosy. Are not Abana and far, far the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Can I not wash in them and be clean? He turned and went away in a rage. But his servants approached and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said to you was wash and be clean? So he went down, immersed himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. Then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company. He came and stood before him and said, Now I know. How many times have we heard that in the series? Now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Please accept a present from your servant. But if we were to go on, we'd see that Elijah won't take anything from the healing. I'm reminded of a t-shirt that my supervisor had in his office when I was doing my chaplaincy internship at Duke Hospital. My supervisor during those weeks had a t-shirt posted in his office, and on the t-shirt it read, Pastoral care is not for sale. Because it's not. Pastoral care, whether that's God's care or the care of God's prophets and, and God's ministers, it's not for sale. It can't be bought. And, but Naaman just can't wrap his mind around this concept. You see it in the whole passage. He's, he's trying to, to buy his healing. He thinks that his wealth and his power and his influence will get him special treatment. But it never does. You know, when he hears there's a prophet in Israel, he immediately assumes that it must be an official prophet. It must be one of the king's prophets. It must be in the king's court. So he gets his king to write their king a letter so he'll have references, so he'll have influence. He goes ahead and gathers up all of all the things that he might be able to use to buy his, the favor. It says he takes 75 talents of silver and 6,000 shekels of gold, which is roughly 750 pounds of silver and 150 pounds of gold, which at today's market rate is about $3.1 million worth 
of precious metals. And on top of that, he takes ten sets of garments. And I guess how much that's worth depends on where he shops. But regardless, you know, he's trying to pull together all of his influence, the letter from the king, all of his liquid assets, anything he can get his hands on to try to buy this healing. But it doesn't work that way. In fact, the prophet, El prophet Elisha doesn't even go outside to meet him. And he pouts. He pouts. Surely for a great man like me, he would want to come outside and show off, do a great show for someone as important as me. The miracle is not for sale. Naaman doesn't set the terms. And to be honest, for someone like him who's so used to being in charge, that's a hard pill to swallow. And he starts grumbling about it. Why do I have to bathe in the Jordan? We got better rivers back home. Grumble, grumble, grumble. Yeah, you, know, you can almost hear him saying what he's really saying is, that's below my dignity. And you know, that's really the irony of the entire story. Those at the top of society, those who are used to knowing how to get what they want through their status or their influence or their power, well, in this story, they're clueless and ineffective. And it's those at the bottom, those who we might be tempted to, to say are unimportant, who are actually the means to the healing. The true heroes in the story, other than God, of course, the other true heroes are the serpents. And it all starts because of the words that come from a, a servant girl who's been taken captive in battle. And in that society, you can't get to anything lower than that. A young servant girl taken in battle. And you can't have any greater contrast in that culture between a young servant girl taken in battle and the great commander who led the attack. But yet it's her who knows about the prophet in Israel. But Naaman doesn't get it. He just thinks it must be a, a royal prophet. So he goes to his king and that king, but neither of them know what's going on. The king of Israel doesn't pick up what's going on. Which means he wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. Back in Deuteronomy, when, when God gives instructions for what kings of Israel should and should not do, God was pretty clear time and time again that the kings of Israel shouldn't be trying to make foreign alliances. They should be trusting in God and to help them do that, they should keep a copy of the law, they should keep a copy of the scriptures at their side and read it every single day. Every day be reading the scriptures to deepen their own relationship with God so that they would be able to see what God was doing around them. The king doesn't do it. He misses the point. He's caught up thinking about potential insults and foreign affairs and, and wars and he just misses what God's doing right there in front of him. But fortunately, Elisha hears he hears what's going on, and so Naaman goes to Elisha's house, but as we said, Elisha won't even come out, and, and Naaman balks at it, begins to go away mad. When again, it's the servants who are the heroes. The servants who come and say to him, Father, if he, he'd asked you to do something great, if he'd asked you to do something difficult, you would have done it in a heartbeat. Why won't you do something simple? What's there to lose? You know, that's probably the question that started the whole thing in the beginning. What's there to lose? In that culture, why else would a great commander like Naaman take advice from a servant girl? In that culture, it would not happen unless maybe he or somebody else asked him, what's there to lose? He tried everything else. Everything else that normally worked for him, his, his connections, his influence, his wealth, but... But this time they didn't work. And so in desperation, probably, he tries something that seems below his dignity. He goes and he washes in the Jordan River. And he's healed. And he still tries to pay for it because I haven't quite settled in yet that miracles aren't for sale. That they're just gifts from the God whose grace always comes to us at no cost. Gifts from the God who he ran into in the midst of his desperation. It hasn't quite fully set in yet. But still, like so many of us, so many times in the series, when Naaman runs into God, he comes to faith. But it's ironic, isn't it, that it's, it's this great commander who's so blind, while it's those who we would normally just skip over as being unimportant, those who aren't even named in the story, they have no names, the servant girl, 
Haman's servants. They're the ones who know what's going on the whole time. It's ironic. And, and it drives home the point of this story, which, in the words of one of the commentators who I read this week, is that material disadvantage is not spiritual disadvantage. But if we're not careful, material advantage might hinder our perception of God. Now, this is a lesson I learned a few summers ago when I was interning at a church in Charlotte. One day we went out and we took a tour of all the different ministries all over the city that help the poor. And when we got to the Urban Ministry Center, their homeless choir was singing. They were singing a song that was very popular that summer. It was a song entitled, God is Good. And the lyrics of the song include these lines, God, my God, God is good. He put food on my table, and he put shoes on my feet so he could guide my every footstep. He healed my every sickness with no money in my pocket. He made a way out of no way. God, my God, God is good. Now at that point in my life, I just finished my first year of seminary, and I knew just enough theology to get myself in trouble. And so I remember thinking to myself, how can you sing that? How can that be your theology? You of all people, you the poorest of the poor, who know what it is to have no food, who know what it is to be barefoot, how can your faith be in the God who might put shoes on your feet? How can your faith depend on the food that you may or may not have at your next meal? Where is that God going to be the next time you skip a meal? How can that be your faith? You know, it took me a long time to realize that that's not what they were meaning when they sang that song. They weren't proclaiming that God is good because of what God has given. Not that God is good because of the food they may or may not have. Rather, because at some point in their life they had run into God. Because at some point they had run into God and knew deep down in their souls that God is good. Because of that, they would thank God for every little thing they have. Something that, you know, frankly, if I'm going to be honest, I don't always do. I've always had shoes, I've always had food, never been hungry. I don't always remember to stop and thank God for each and every little thing. Material advantage, if we're not careful, can be a spiritual disadvantage. When we get used to relying about on our wealth or our health care or our influence or whatever it is, and when we forget to look for what God might be doing in or through or around us, or we begin, or we forget to look for the ways God might be calling us to use those resources that we have to go about God's business. There's nothing wrong with having those resources. It's, it's when we forget to look for how God might be calling us to use them for God's business. we can end up where Naaman was. You know, for him it took it all being stripped away. For Naaman it took everything that used to work, everything that he used to rely upon being stripped away, all of that stuff no longer working. It took that to bring him back to God. But you know, it doesn't have to take that. It doesn't need to go that far. For you see, the good news of our passage is this. If you're feeling desperate this morning, if you're in a place this morning where everything that you're used to relying upon no longer works, the good news of our scripture is that God meets us when we're desperate. We still run into God when everything else has failed us. But you know, the challenge of our passage is simple. The challenge of the passage is that if we are relying on things other than God and they're still working, whether that's wealth, privilege, whatever it might be, whatever we might call it, if we're still relying on those things other than God, the challenge is to turn those things over for God to use. Because the day is going to come when those things no longer satisfy or when those things are not enough. And it happens happened to name it, it happens to all of us at different times or in different ways. But how much better when that time comes, 
when the things that we're used to relying upon are not enough, how much better if we're already learned to rely on God? Let's pray together. Eternal God, there are so many things that that we are tempted to try to rely on other than you. And and sometimes they work, Lord, and, and sometimes they don't. Lord, as we've said so many times in this series, we come with one hope. This whole series, to run into you. Lord, for Naaman, it took all of those things to fail. Lord, may it not be so with us. Help us to learn how to rely upon you, to trust in you, to find our strength in you, a strength that doesn't disappoint. For Lord, that's the strength that we come seeking today. As we come to this table in a few minutes today, Lord, we pray that as we, we meet you in these gifts of bread and wine, Lord, that those who are desperate might find comfort. Those who are desperate might find peace and courage and strength to face this day. And Lord, for all of us, as we come and are met by you, may we be be strengthened by you in this meal to put our trust in you, to offer what we have up to you, to give them to you, for you to do with them what you will, for the sake of your business, for the sake of your kingdom. Amen.